Sampai recognizes peer-reviewed publications. More than 35 TNOA members have benefited in this publish and prosper initiative of TNOA. The walk the talk with Dr. Siddharthan and Dr. RDR sir has inspired, motivated, and rejuvenated us. We have also come out with a novel TNOA OVL initiative, Ophthalmic Video League. Let your videos do the talking under the theme of educate, enlighten, and enjoy. Four minutes of showcasing of surgical work with a clear take-home uh, messages. So we welcome all our members to a continuous clinical and academic 24-7, 365 days of activity of TNOA portal under the, our inspired leadership of our president, Dr. Mohan Rajan. TNOA is indeed shining even in these inclement weather conditions. I welcome you all and I request Dr. Nishant to introduce panelists and set the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. Hello. Hello. Hey, yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir. So, uh, welcome you all for this amazing uh, session, which is uh, moderated by Dr. Ashwin and myself. So, we would like to uh, first uh, uh, let uh, Dr. Ashwin invite the speakers. I will just say the order in which we might be going ahead with. So, we'll have Dr. Priya talking about complex IOL exchange cases. Dr. Amrita might talk about Aneridia IOLs. Dr. Susan Jacob will talk about the decimates diaries of complex PDEX. Dr. Mohan Rajan about traumatic subluxated cataracts. Dr. Gaurav will talk about freaky lenses. Dr. Ashwin about blue dye oil. Dr. Samresh about managing astigmatism. Dr. Soon Fake about the Morganian sorrows. And Dr. Arshaf from HM to 0 0.6. So this will be the list of speakers and we have some amazing uh, sessions. There are some live sessions and there are some recorded sessions which will be moderated by Dr. Ashwin. And uh, now uh, I give it to Dr. Ashwin to take over. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, folks, for having this. I think, honestly, uh, TNO is doing such a wonderful job of, you know, educating so many people around the world through this uh, Connect series. Uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan for his leadership as well as everybody on this panel uh, because each of you are doing so much uh, to, you know, educate the uh, the ophthalmologists around the world. Uh, going, uh, let's kick things off with uh, a really good uh, presentation from Priya. So Priya, uh, I'm going to leave the floor with you uh, and let's let's start the show. And immediately once you're done, we can have a small round of two, three minutes of uh, questions for your presentation. Uh, sure. Let's just stick to time. So we will be about approximately about 10 minutes per speaker and about uh, two, three minutes after that for uh, questions. Perfect. Um, is my screen uh, seen by everybody? Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, Ashwin and Dr. Mohan Rajan for having me here and the entire uh, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic uh, Society for uh, inviting me to this uh, symposium, challenging case symposium. So, well, uh, today uh, I have been asked to cover up the uh, complex IOL challenging cases, the exchange, the IOL exchange cases. So I will be showing here, uh, it's just one video, but you know, this video actually, it summarizes everything. And this is how the clinical picture looks like, what you see on the right side. So this is a young girl and she had a history of congenital cataract and, you know, uh, she had undergone a cataract surgery with an IOL implantation. And this is what I see her right now. So uh, as you can see, there is uh, the patient had a refractive error. Um, you can see this PCIO, which has, which is now lying in the anterior chamber. Probably it has slipped uh, into the anterior chamber. Probably there was some PC thickening. So the surgeon must have done a YAG laser. So you have an opening out there in the center. 
Uh, you have iridocapsular radiations out here. You can see the somering ring in the superior aspect, and you can also see an upfront pupil. So like uh, uh, there are multiple things, you know, that needs to be done in this case. So I'll just go ahead with showcasing this uh, one video. And uh, well, uh, I'll keep on pausing this video as and when it is necessary. So now this is a case uh, which I uh, pick up for the surgery. So um, this is a 180 degree axis marking that I have done and I have made two flaps for glued intrasteral fixation. Uh, the second thing that I'm going to do, I'll just pause this here for a second. Uh, I have made two flaps, uh, partial thickness for the glued. And the next thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to make a scleral incision. Uh, in this case, I particularly choose to make uh, an L-shaped incision. Uh, this L-shaped incision I'm trying to make because I need to explant this intraocular lens out and I need to implant another intraocular lens inside the eye. So uh, I have chosen this L-shaped incision because, you know, it has been documented to have uh, less astigmatism. It does not induce it. There is something good about it. Actually, it's not something new which has been described right now, but this was there into practice quite long back and it has been documented in the early 90s that this kind of incision was being made. So we just picked up this incision and you can just see it's a scleral pocket that is being made here. Uh, this is the um, fluid infusion. I usually, in these complex cases, I try to use a trocar anterior chamber maintainer because, you know, you have so many things going on inside the eye and at no point of time, I want the anterior chamber maintainer to slip uh, from the uh, eye because you need a continuous uh, infusion because in these complex cases, what often happens is that, you know, if you have an anterior chamber maintainer and it slips out, you know, you have a collapsed eye at that point of time. So what I have done now is that making a sclerotomy and I'm trying to do a vitrectomy. Uh, I have cut down all the additions which are there behind the intraocular lens. Now, what you see here in this L-shaped incision is that, you know, actually you have an internal lip of about three millimeter, uh, of about six millimeters. It's not actually a uh, three. Uh, you have an inner extension where you get a six millimeter, but it is actually a volvular kind of thing. So now what I have done in this case is, you know, I'm trying to rotate this intraocular lens and just see if I can slip this intraocular lens and if it's freely mobile, because otherwise we also need to cut down the additions. But luckily, I could rotate this and I could flip this outside the uh, uh, scleral incision, the L-shaped incision, which I had made. So the next thing that I'm trying to do here is, you know, I'm using an iris spatula and I'm trying to uh, disinsert the additions from each of the capsular additions from the iris. But actually, uh, I was not lucky in this because I just thought that probably if I get good amount of sulcus, it would be really helpful, but actually that does not work in this case. So I go ahead, frankly, uh, by putting clients in a lawn, doing a vitrectomy, I'm trying to cut down all the, the entire posterior capsule, which is there, the remnants, uh, actually it's all fibrotic and it is actually very difficult uh, to uh, remove this with the vitrectomy probe often. So now you can see, I'll just pause this video again here. There is a somering ring here in the superior aspect. So now what actually happens is that, you know, when you are doing a vitrectomy and you are trying to release this somering ring, if you do not support this somering ring, it might slip back into the posterior uh, cavity because you do not have any lens or anything lying out there. So what I try to do at this point is, you know, uh, I'm trying to release the additions. And as soon as I release the additions, I have put a spatula beneath this somering ring that you can see so that, you know, it does not slip back into the posterior cavity. And I'm trying to cut down all the additions out here. These additions are very thick and the vitrectomy probe often, you know, you keep on doing it for maybe 10 minutes or so. It does not actually happen. But once if you are sure that, you know, you have cut down all the vitreous and all, you can take the scissors and you can go inside and you need to, you can cut them off. So after the somering rings removal is done, I can now see that my field is quite clear. And now I can go ahead with the IOM implantation. So now I have taken a three piece intraocular lens and I'm trying to do a glued oil fixation. Dr. Ashwin will be covering much more on the finer aspects of this. So I'll just go ahead briefly with this procedure that you know uh, you have to be very careful well, uh, when you are externalizing the haptics, you need to hold the haptics from the tip and you need do not kink it. And you just then, uh, once you have externalized both the haptics, you can just, uh, you know, tuck it and you are almost done. So now what I'm trying to do here is the pupiloplasty. Now this video is about four to five years old where I did this. So in this case specifically, you know, I had done a modified sepsis, but now these days we always do a single pass through pupiloplasty procedure. 
which is quite simple, easy. You go ahead with one single pass and you are almost done. You can see that here I'm taking a second pass and I'm doing it. But these days with the single pass for tutoplasty coming up, things have become very fast and very much easier for us. So once done, I have removed the anterior chamber maintainer, put up the fibrin glue, I'm sealing up everything and this works perfectly well. Uh, this girl currently she's doing quite well and actually uh, she's a medical student. So, and she tends to pursue ophthalmology after seeing this, you know, so it's, it's really a proud moment. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, for allowing me to share this uh, video here. Thank you, Priya. That was uh, wonderful. So a question that actually I wanted to ask the panel as well. Uh, and, and I think it's important for uh, people who are seeing Sommering rings when they see it on slit lamp, you know, when they comes up. Uh, when you tackle such cases, do you actually uh, go ahead and actually address the Sommering ring or do we leave it? I mean, a lot of times the question is that you're putting a secondary eye oil. It's not affecting the central, uh, you know, three, four millimeters, uh, which is the main... Uh, sight giving uh, pupil, uh, do you actually address the sombering ring or do we leave it? I mean, that's a basic question. I want to start. Uh, yeah, I'll answer this, uh, Ashwin. Uh, sure. In this case, uh, Dr. Priya was perfectly right. She had to remove the sombering ring because she was, she has to close that iris gap. And that suturing of the iris would not have been possible with the addition that was there with the posterior capsule. So she had to remove the sombering ring. If there is no adhesion between the iris and the posterior capsule, or you can tease away those adhesions, yes, you can leave the shamring lip back because it's usually sealed off. It's completely sealed off and it, not, it is not going to cause any problems. So I, I guess we have to look at it on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, if you're not going to need to handle the iris, or there's no great adhesion, absolutely leave it alone. In this case, she was perfectly right in what she did. That's a very nice surgery, Dr. Priya. Thank you so much. I would like to add one point in this. Uh, 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 Dr. Barman, I had one case wherein I left the sombering ring. As you said, you know, even I had the same opinion that this is not going to hamper anything and I can face the intraocular lens and do away. But what I found was that, you know, um, the haptic, uh, they do not come into alignment. There is a slight tilt, you know, which comes up. This might contribute, this contributes to astigmatism in the post-operative period. So if it is possible to scrap it off, from there, that's the best thing. Unless, I mean, you have to weigh down the benefit and the risk ratio that comes up. Uh, so uh, I, I think we need to take a calculated uh, uh, effort in doing that. So so that's a that's a great call. Uh, I think that's a- Good morning, uh, good morning, Ashwin. Hi, morning, sir. Morning, good morning. I'll be, uh, I'm just traveling the car, but I'll be uh, there in my hospital in five, five to 10 minutes. But you're looking dashing as Go usual. Go ahead. Dashing as usual, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ashwin, can I add one point? Yes, please, Nibir. Uh, I think uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen a couple of videos before and Priya's videos are always amazing, actually. So the two things once you already mentioned, sometimes it can actually fall back to the vitreous cavity later if there are some loose fragments. So that is one reason. And the second interesting thing is you just can't pull it away because of the addition. So I've seen your previous videos where you will have to have a traction and make sure you use the cutter to release those fragments before actually pulling it out because that can cause a peripheral dialysis later on. So I think these two are some of the important key take-home messages from the video. And also you can use the IOL, the glued IOL as a scaffold to remove it or even sometimes I've done a FACO because in a larger chunk, uh, sometimes with the clear cornea incision where you do a foldable IOL, you can actually use a IOL scaffold technique to remove it. So, so I Perfect. think all the three ways to remove it yeah. is better to remove it. Thanks. Th Nivian, thank you so much. That, that's absolutely right. You know, the sombering ring actually sits inside the anterior posterior capsule. It sits within it. It's not an open capsule. It's actually, it gets closed down. So you actually have to open this up and then pull out the sombering ring piece. The chunk is inside that. And imagine that all, all around the skirt. Uh, and that's, that's the trick uh, behind this, uh, removing the sombering ring. So it is not an easy procedure. It is a challenging one. Uh, so, you know, use uh, iris hooks, visualize things, don't do it blindly. Those are certain things in you, you, probably some tricks and trips that help if you're going to handle these challenging cases or just send them over to Priya. Either which Thank way you. works. <laughs> Give yes. them a flight, uh, flight uh, ticket Dr. to Amrapad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so we're moving on to the next presentation, which is by Dr. Namrata Sharma. And uh, Dr. Namrata is 
just start her presentation. Okay. I'm she going to be sharing it. One? She's, yeah, she's sent me a pre-recorded one. So I'm just going to be sharing her presentation. Please let me know if you're able to see this uh, presentation, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I would be talking to you about a difficult situation uh, which can occur, and that is management of aniridia. So, aniridia can be managed uh, by using a black iris diaphragm intraocular lens, especially in those cases where cataract surgery has been done. Or sometimes, when you have a traumatic aniridia, then you may also require segments or rings to address it. Now, uh, this is a case of um, uh, black iris diaphragm intraocular lens, which is placed uh, uh, in a case of cataract. And in these cases, because the uh, diameter of the lens is uh, uh, about 12.5 millimeters, uh, you do require a bigger incision. And there is, uh, as of now, no foldable option in India. So after uh, uh, making that, uh, capsular excess can be made through a smaller incision. And uh, this is then uh, uh, irrigation aspiration of the lens matter can be done. And this was a younger patient, so only irrigation aspiration was required. And subsequently, the incision was uh, enlarged. And this is the intraocular lens. This can be fixed, but if there is a sulcus present, then this can be also placed in the sulcus, as was uh, done in this case. Uh, it is very difficult to get these lenses into the bag. Uh, and the material is uh, PMMA, so there is hardly any reaction present to it. And then subsequently, uh, this is sutured. Uh, this was the same case uh, which came to us after three years, and there were uh, some uh, proliferation of the um, um, cells on the posterior capsule here. And so in these cases, in this case, the, uh, the clearing of this was done with the help of the uh, vitrectomy probe. And uh, irrigation was placed anterior to the intraocular lens and the vitreous cutter was uh, placed posterior to it. And uh, subsequently, the uh, uh, cells were cleared. Um, in fact, uh, it just cleared without having to cut anything, only uh, using the aspiration of the cells and the uh, PC was easily polished uh, and cleared of the cells and it was still intact at the end of the surgery. So uh, this is how uh, this case was managed and now three years post-op bilateral is uh, still doing well. Now, uh, sometimes when you've already done a cataract surgery or the cases are referred to you from elsewhere, then you can also suture these sterile uh, fixated eyewells through the ab internal technique with the four point fixation and either proline or cortex can be used for the same. So proline is a lot cheaper. It is easily available. It is time tested. Uh, cortex is, is the stronger material and is less immunogenic. The flip side of proline is that it may induce some inflammation. Uh, there may be some memory which exists and there may be loss of tensile strength over a period of time. The uh, disadvantages of Gotex are that it is difficult to bury uh, and there is a risk of exposure. Uh, relatively, it is a new material and it is not backed by two to three decades of experience. So this was a case uh, which was referred to us from elsewhere where cataract surgery had already been done. And in this case, two pockets were made first. Uh, the double peritomy was done on each side. And uh, uh, two millimeters was marked, uh, two 2.5 millimeters was marked away from the limbus on either side and with the help of the blade picker, uh, uh, just a um, incision was uh, given on either side just to make a pocket and with the help of the crescent blade, uh, 0.2 millim uh, two millimeters uh, inside uh, was uh, reached by um, making a small pocket there. So likewise, uh, again, the pocket was made on the other side. And then again, because it's a large lens, the incision was made large, and uh, this is the marking of the uh, incision uh, that was done. And subsequently, the uh, crescent blade was used to uh, fashion this uh, so that uh, one could make the incision. And then entry was done with the help of the 3.2 millimeter blade. The scoelastic was then uh, injected. And after injecting the viscoelastic, the straight needle was taken on the proline suture. And this was uh, then uh, taken out uh, from the 
this is bent slightly because it helps the maneuverability of the needle. And uh, subsequently, uh, this needle was placed inside the pocket and then a 26 gate needle was taken, which was dropped out. And then this suture was uh, then placed onto this eyelet so that uh, the, a knot is formed here so that the lens is held uh, with the help of this suture. Uh, subsequently, uh, at another area, uh, again, a uh, 26 gauge needle was taken and uh, the same bent uh, needle uh, on a proline suture was then taken from the main wound and was uh, docked with the help of this 26 gauge needle on the other side. And uh, when this was uh, done, the whole IOL complex was then placed on the other side and the same thing was repeated uh, on the uh, uh, the other eyelet as well. So uh, the other eyelet was also threaded similarly. Uh, this is again the uh, 26 gauge needle which is being used to, uh, to and it is taken out from the main wound. Uh, the incision is enlarged and the lens was then placed and both the knots which, are which were uh, formed at each of these pockets were then uh, tied. Of course, uh, you may have to do a little bit of adjustment on each of the sides to see that the lens is uh, perfectly centered. And uh, both the entry and the exit point on these pockets is different so that the knot can be tied and the knot then gets buried inside the pocket that has been created and subsequently sutures are applied on the main wound. Now, uh, you may also require aniridia rings in these uh, cases of aniridia, such as this. This was a case of traumatic aniridia. And uh, in this uh, part of the uh, iris was missing. So uh, the intraocular lens placement was already there. And uh, the bag was uh, inflated uh, with the help of the viscoelastic agent. Uh, this was a case so actually of a repaired corneal perforation where IOL had already been placed. And uh, these are the NIV having segments which are available. They are very fragile, so they have to be handled with care. So first NIV segment is dialed in the bag using the metpherson and the uh, Sinsky hook. And very carefully it is held uh, with the uh, metpherson. And then the second segment is uh, then inserted over the first one so that it just fills in the gap and the color becomes brown and in the post-op period, uh, the overlap uh, diaphragms, they lead into the uh, correct position um, and they block the peripheral flow completely. So uh, it, it is important that in these cases of uh, NRAD IOLs, uh, the glaucoma may worsen after the implantation of the uh, NRAD IOL and NRAD Rings are placed in the bag are associated uh, with much lesser complication. Then UGH syndrome can occur in these uh, black iris diaphragm lenses, which is mainly because of the contact with the ciliary body due to the large size. But there is improvement in the best way to visual acuity and elevation of photophobia. And these cases do have to be followed up over a long period of time. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I have a wonderful, wonderful video. I must thank uh, Dr. Namrata for sending that over because I think it's a, a very important part of our practice. You know, we see so many cases of uh, where the iris is damaged because of whatever reason, you know, firecracker, uh, blast injuries, pencil, uh, pencil touch, uh, so many reasons why the iris gets damaged. And uh, I, I really want to take this opportunity, you know, to kind of tell if there is trade watching this, you know, that we need foldable, these lenses do need to become foldable at some point because we still are dealing with uh, PMMA lenses. We don't need to be opening up the eyes to, you know, implant these IOLs. And, and that's a huge part of our uh, portfolio that really needs to grow. Uh, and we need to be able to help these patients out in many, many ways. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, the panel, uh, guys, when you're implanting these, what are the tips and tricks that we can tell people to implant these aniridia IOLs? Uh, if you have any, if you've used these and, and stuff. Can I, can uh, I it's going to be very difficult to use any of these lenses because first, uh, the aniridia lenses are very large. They have 12 mm, so the incision has to be very large. 
Right. Two, you're, you're not going to be able to put it in the bag. It's going to be in the sulcus. So that's going to cause a bit of inflammation. And most importantly, anerida, whether it is uh, congenital or it is going to be traumatic, the chances of angle closure is going to be very high. So that's, that's going to be something you need to keep in mind. As well as the anerida rings that we put in, I've used quite a few of those. They're far more forgiving because most often these are in patients who had traumatic uh, partial iris loss. And uh, usually you can put it inside the bag. Uh, it's a bit of a tight fit. You'll have to get it tiled in properly. And of course, as Dr. Namrata said, it's very, very fragile. The first time I tried, I broke two. So once you get that in, the results are brilliant. So the difficulty is going to be, one, the large lens. And like you said, we need to probably get foldable lenses uh, to answer that question. But whatever questions answered, you're left with the high chance close to 50% chance of developing severe glaucoma postoperatively. So you have to follow up these patients and be ready to handle the glaucoma appropriately. Beautiful. Perfect. Uh, Ashwin, I, I, have a, I have a comment to make, but I will do it after all the panelists. Sure. Anybody else wants to say something? Uh, Nivian? I just want to ask a question. Uh, which company is currently available and doing it? Okay. Only so IOCare IO care makes both the large lenses as well as those segments. They've been making it for quite some time now, mm -hmm. over 10 or 15 years. And the second question to the panelists, like uh, I've heard of this uh, company called the Human Optics where they make the, only the artificial iris. So because these lenses are huge and bulky, so we can keep a normal foldable and use only a segment of the iris that can be actually sutured like this for these iris defects. So right. anybody has any experience or take on that? No experience. No experience, but I have a take on it. I think it's beautiful. The, the idea is absolutely solid because you can actually put a foldable lens with that uh, human optic uh, iris. In fact, uh, even if you want to do a glued intraocular lens, you can actually suture that uh, IOL to that uh, human optics and then implant it like as though you're just doing a normal glued. And then that really works. And I've seen that uh, in a lot of videos, actually. I haven't, I don't have uh, this thing on it personal experience on it but i think uh, once it does launch in india or even if i'm able to get one in india the problem is getting the receiving this product is not so easy and it's yeah, very expensive I have with mca getting this product inside actually so. yeah and it's very expensive as well uh, to for the patient to afford that human optics is actually not available in india as yet the advantage is that it can be put into the anterior capsule uh, um, you know, within the bag, I mean, it can be put within the bag. So that's a special advantage in these aniridia patients, unlike the traumatic uh, uh, aniridia where you might have to just complete a small segment of the iris, you can still put it in the sulcus, but in aniridia, putting it in the bag becomes really crucial because then otherwise it can just float up and cause iris, uh, corneal damage, angle damage and all that. So human optics is beautiful. Also, it's uh, just for the audience to know, I'm uh, sure many of you already know it. Uh, that it can be color matched exactly to the patient's other eye. So you take a photograph of the other eye and you send it to the company and they actually color match it even to the specs, uh, you know, the, the fine texture of the uh, patient's normal iris and everything so that you get a beautiful cosmetic outcome. And as Ashwin said, already uh, it can be fixed to a glued uh, IOL, a foldable glued IOL with just threading the haptics through it. And so you can do everything through a small incision. So that's really a beautiful technique. Absolutely. Susan, my one uh, question. I'm sorry, it might be very basic, but uh, isn't it better it being in the sulcus? Because if you're going to put it in the bag and with the uh, haptics, which are going to stretch it, the, it's going to be only in the center and the area where the zonules are all there, that yeah. it, you are still going to ha not have any iris. So, if, so you're, if you're going to fix it with the glued IOL, then it doesn't matter because it's fixed to the glued IOL. Now, it's, there's no chance of it moving anteroposterior. So then you, of course, put it in the sulcus, but that's with a glued IOL. But if you're doing it with an in-the-bag IOL or uh, something like that, then it goes into the bag. Because otherwise, in aniridia cases, it can move and that can cause uh, problems over the long term. And we know, uh, you know, iris implants, because human optics doesn't have a history like that. But otherwise, our cosmetic iris implants have had a very, very bad history in and terms of uh, uh, glaucoma and glaucoma is damage, big iris big damage and so on and so forth. Yeah, glaucoma is a big concern over there. But uh, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why the human optics started to go in, in the bag. Uh, but yeah, uh, moving on. Thank you so much, uh, panel. We are moving on to. Uh, Ashwin, I just have a comment to make. Oh, yes, Ashwin, yes, please. yeah, yeah. I, I use these aniridia lenses, uh, the the non foldable ones. Uh, the only thing is, uh, I've done the glued IOL, I've done the uh, sutured screen, full, especially when you're pulling, trying to pull the haptic out because the haptics are very fragile 
and normally you don't have a backup aniridia lens yes. so fortunately in one case you now i had a backup aniridia lens i was able to manage that but i have seen also another thing is i also use the sir sir are you there? these uh, patients especially from the iocar group uh, which are uh, that's the uh, only thing which is available with us to now so uh, both in the aniridia lenses as well as for the uh, aniridia rings as well we have found that after 10 15 years the uh, it starts uh, branching a little so uh, not little uh, some of the patients even significantly i don't know how many people have noticed this i don't know what is the reason for that probably because of the uh the eye is going up and down and with this a pigment release from the surface of the lens as well uh, exactly we do not know by we ask the company also they are not able to answer so this is one thing i just wanted to bring to your notice oh, absolutely i think those are very very valid points and issues that people will have if they are using this lens is something that we really need to know in in these uh challenging cases yeah, uh, just Ashwin. one more point if i can Please. make Yeah. Uh, the the thing about uh, you know the haptic breaking because it's a single piece IOL is really very valid uh, so you have to be very careful with uh, implanting it uh, and one some of the tips that you can you know actually employ to avoid that happening is you have to make a really large corneal section corneal scleral section rather not a corneal section like an SICS section or something so make a large one that helps the haptic from breaking so that you're not really flexing the haptic too much the second important tip I think is that you get the first you of course have to cut the eyelet uh, that's because you're going to do a glued eyelet technique so you really don't need the eyelet there unless you're planning to do a suture fixation. So uh, you take the first haptic out, and then you kind of let the IUL, the entire IUL, with the second haptic drop down into the vitreous. Don't try to flex the other second haptic and bring it out. Now, once the second haptic is dropped into the vitreous, you can easily go in with your uh, forceps and just grab it from deep down. So instead of having to flex the haptic so much and then risk the uh, you know uh, the the possibility of its cracking and uh, you're having to explant the IUL, you can just do this technique. Basically, you let it drop down. Then you go down with your uh, forceps vertical. Ah, uh, Navy, Ah, uh, Navyan. I can see Navyan moving forwards. You have to do a good vitrectomy before you do that, uh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that you don't pull uh, the vitreous at all. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's that's one yeah. way of uh, getting the haptic out without breaking it. Fantastic. Thank you for all those points, uh, panel and uh, Susan as well. Susan, uh, I'm going to leave the floor with you because I know it's your presentation next, and I think you're going to talk about desmet dairies or complex speed. I'll. I I am I'm always uh, bedazzled with your presentation so go ahead thanks uh, thanks a lot ashwin uh, this just just to clarify this is uh, going to be just on desmets it's really not a pdec that is a choice of uh, uh, topics that i had sent you uh, so it's just desmets diaries alone it's Absolutely. an interesting case uh, just let me get my powerpoint out here and uh, i hope that it's showing now so this is one of my most complicated cases i would say uh, it is uh, a reasonable number of years back i think it was in 2017 or late 2016 maybe that i did it and uh, it's just uh, i came across a video recently again and i thought this is a really interesting video to show so i'm sorry this is the case let me just skip to this uh, this is a 45 year old gentleman who had a history of uh, some kind of a trauma to the eye about 30 years back he had noticed a bulge uh, at that time and he had undergone a patch graft at a local hospital and he is presented now with this ectatic thinned patch graft uh, you know extremely extreme thinning you can see here and uh, if you look again a uh, lot of thinning lot of protrusion of that uh, patch graft in fact it's uh, almost like a uh, localized staphyloma of the patch graft uh, per se and uh, 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 extreme thinning to the uh, to the you know limit that extent that you can actually kind of see into the vitreous cavity and he's also got a cataract he's got perfilantia sinica he's got a dilated pupil and all of that so let me just play the video so that's that's the uh, area of uh, ectasia of the patch graft so what i'm going to do is or rather what i plan to do was that i would attack the patch graft part later uh, and uh, you know repair that part later and do the cataract first so the ex extensive perfilantia sinica all around as you can see so what i did first was uh, try to get some space in the anterior chamber for myself by trying to release this perfilantia sinica so i go ahead with the putting viscoelastic to take this blunt rod and do a sinicolysis a uh, 360 degree sinicolysis basically and then i go ahead and uh, i once i've done that i go ahead and uh, do a capsulotomy unfortunately in the editing because this video was edited 20 in 2017 immediately after that i have lost the part where i did the 
uh, Rexes. But here's what's important. After all that's done, I am looking at the uh, uh, the eye and I notice some reflexes uh, in the anterior chamber. So if you can also see that there's a reflex there in the anterior chamber, I'm really not happy with that uh, because definitely it means something's wrong. And now it's seen more clearly. Uh, the, the capsule is already open, uh, but there's also a, a desmet, uh, detachment somewhere here. So I try to stain it with the uh, trepan blue, a uh, little bit helpful, but not too much. Uh, and it'll become more apparent soon. Uh, so now the reflex is being seen since it was difficult to see. I put off the microscope light and you can see I'm uh, operating with the endoilluminator now. And uh, I decide since the anti-capsule is al already broken, uh, my options are really limited. I would have to remove uh, as much of the cataract as possible to prevent uh, really a severe uveitic reaction in the post-operative period. So I'm hoping that I can deal with the dismissed detachment, which is really much more clearly visible now, as you can see. I don't want to go in with a FACO probe because, uh, you know, the things can happen very fast and go quickly out of control. So I decided to just use the, uh, uh, decide to just use the uh, simple know. cannula instead. And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get everything out here. So you can uh, again see the cortex and uh, you know, so luckily for me, the white cataract was a soft cataract. So I'm able to get most of it out here. And uh, I'm really getting more and more unhappy with the amount of dismissed detachment that is here. So uh, at this point, I decided to put in an air bubble and uh, kind of reanalyze and try to see what I can do because uh, there's a lot of uh, the cataract still left behind. And finally, I uh, this was the time Dr. Amar had just uh, you know described the uh, trocar anterior chamber maintainer. So I decide that I'm going to put in that, but for a different purpose. So I'm sorry, I'll just show you that bit again. I'm getting the trocar ACM uh, put into place and I've got air going in through that. And I decide to do an air pump assisted cataract extraction. So you can see uh, here, uh, the air is the air bubbles are slowly coming out and it's kind of keeping the Desmet's membrane floating up. Uh, uh, if you put that off, you can see what's happening. The dismiss uh, membrane actually comes in and gets caught by the Simco. And it's, I'm really uh, you know, worried at that point whether I'm going to pull it out. But when I put in the air pump, uh, things are much more smoother. I'm able to remove most of the cortex from the inferior part. Uh, it's just a superior part again. Again, you watch uh, when the air pump uh, is not really getting the uh, flow in, it's more difficult. But with the air going, it really becomes uh, easier. I wouldn't say much more easier because visibility is compromised. But at least uh, I know that I'll not strip the uh, or the chances of my stripping the dismiss off is much lesser rather. So I've kind of done a reasonable cortical cleanup. And now I go in and again implant the IOL, which you can see under air pump. So the air pump is constantly uh, putting in air into the anterior chamber. I've got the IOL implanted and then uh, once I'm done with the cataract part, I come back to the skeletal patch graft. I guess we can just go through this faster. Uh, what I do is uh, basically assess the amount of uh, conuscleral patch graft that I need to use and disk this uh, stephyloma off, have the vitrector ready, of course, because the vitreous was already being seen coming in through that. Uh, I suture the anterior part of the uh, stephyloma in place, and then I'm uh, further dissecting out that. And you can see that the vitreous cavity was actually entirely open. Most of it uh, is now removed uh, and then I suture that part as well closed and uh, suture the graft on top of it so one second there you go I've sutured the graft also on top of it and uh, I'm going to do uh, put in fibrin glue and uh, finally close the conjunctiva so now uh, I have uh, uh, the air the IOL in place you can see the air bubble is holding the dismiss membrane up and uh, everything seems to be in place. That's the margin of the resmet membrane, if you can see, uh, reasonably well attached. And uh, here's the post-operative appearance. Uh, I think I was really, really happy to see this. Post-op one week, the cornea was clear. Uh, the sutures are in place. Of course, the patch graft is good. Everything is looking good. But the peripheral antisynic had reformed, and I had a raised IOP again. So uh, my plan was now to do uh, put in an uh, Ahmed glaucoma valve. So what I did is basically the uh, usual steps that I do to do an AGV. So I guess we can just skip through this also fast. Uh, I always put the, uh, the tube of the AGV below the iris and not above the iris because I don't like to uh, leave uh, anything in the anterior chamber where it can potentially cause the corneal decompensation over the long term. So you can see I've got it there. Excess tube is trimmed because it was a little bit too long and then reinsert it, get it there under the iris and over the IOL and basically close the uh, conjunctiva. And that's again the immediate post-operative appearance with sutures still in place. The patch graft is looking good. The AGV is looking good. The tube uh, is also seen. And here is uh, the, that's the uh, Ahmed valve. I had to put in the inferior location because of the large area of uh, scleral uh, issues in the superior quadrant. 
and uh, this is five years post op the patient recently came he's maintaining a visual acuity of 618 part which i was very happy about his iop was 15 on two medications fields were maintained uncorrected was 6 uh, by 60 so this patient was really doing uh, extremely well this is his last visit he has a little bit of epithelial thickening in that area where uh, the peripheral antisynecate was there but as you saw the tube tip is seen and uh, patient continue to maintain a uh, very good vision even though the pas were there so that's this video and with the end of that i'll uh, i think i may have a few minutes more so i'll just quickly uh, just go through this dismiss detachment classification which i had proposed which is basically regmatogenous uh, tractional bullous and uh, complex and you can see the different configurations that are clearly seen and i think we as anti segment surgeons really need to know about this because the implications of each is different if you have a regmatogenous dismiss detachment a very similar to a retinal detachment actually uh, dismiss detachment you can have it secondary to hole for example in a dalk with perforation you can have it with the tear or even with a dialysis when it gets detached from the shawlby's line so when you have that what you have to do is basically just a pneumo dismetopexy but if you have tractional dismiss detachment or bullous dismiss detachment as seen here you can see the clear fluid level and the anti segment oct showing the bullous detachment in these cases what you have to do uh, is basically a uh, uh, relaxing dismetotomy this uh, video is courtesy dr vasavda and that was a post operative dismiss detachment which they had noticed and if you can see during surgery there's that fluid which goes you know a fluid uh, a wave which goes across at the end of surgery while doing stromal hydration and these kind of detachments unless recognized and managed uh, immediately can lead to post operative uh, Here, corneal haze, and what you need to do is very, very simple. When you get that, this was a patient who was referred uh, because the dismiss detachment was not resolving, uh, even despite a couple of air injections. And what you do here is very simple: relaxing dismetotomy. There is no cut in the dismiss in this case. There's no tear. Basically, it's not regmatogenous, so it's basically fluid that's trapped there. Uh, there was even blood in that uh, fluid level. You could see that. Okay, what you do is just create a cut by just making a keratome entry, and now there's a cut in the dismiss membrane. So, new dismetopexy will work. a uh, beautifully uh, unlike the other case where it may take very long for it to uh, actually clear up so i think uh, that uh, would bring me to the end of my presentation these are just in ab internal relaxing dismetotomy for tractional dismiss detachments ab external for bullous dismiss detachment and i'll come to the end of my presentation thank you so much thank you susan uh, that was absolutely wonderful and you know we all learn so much from you uh, from especially this complex challenging cornea uh, surgery uh, in terms of desmets uh, i wanted to ask you uh, there's a new terminology in term that it's called dso can you give us a little bit more about what is dso how does it work what is the purpose for it and where do you use it what's the so indication dso is basically uh, desmet stripping only uh, what uh, it's basically it's not done for pseudophagic bullous keratopathy you can employ it for just uh, you know patients with fugue's dystrophy where you have a certain amount of cell count so even in those cases uh, the cell count cannot be too low so you look at the peripheral cell count because uh, generally the center will be affected more uh, look at the peripheral cell count and if you have a certain amount of uh, cell count then you can possibly i don't have any experience with dso but uh, this is what people who have been working on this extensively have said uh, what you do is basically you strip out the central part of the dismiss membrane and when you strip that out what happens is that the peripheral uh, cells can still slide over and clear the cornea so the things to remember is you are going to have an initial period of edema that is going to happen so you have to in, inform the patient about that because still the cells slide over and cover uh, that is going to be there some patients still do not recover and you have to inform the patient that if they do not uh, they may need a, a pereq or a demec later that's important and the third thing is that uh, uh, the the advantage that it offers is basically the chances of rejection of the graft at decrease but we know that the thin membrane grafts like demec and pereq already have a very low level of rejection so Uh, there's a lot to uh, for individual surgeon preference for this. You can add rokinase along with it to improve the results further. There's a lot of technique involved in it. In the sense, you should not have any stromal uh, guttering when you actually strip the dismet. So you have to actually do it like a dismet or excess and not like a scoring. Uh, uh, lots of things like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are people who are doing it, and uh, maybe these this could be. Uh, in fact, I think the future forwards would be cultured endothelial cells, not even DSO, where you. Uh, strip the combination of these two. Strip the desmets, put in cultured endothelial cells, position the patient accordingly, and then follow up with rokinase. Perfect. Just, Thank just you so much. Just a question to the other panel: Would anybody, uh, you know, once you uh, got an extensive desmets detachment and you opened up the anterior capsule, would anybody have done uh, any ideas? I was I was lost, and that was the only thing I could think of at that point. Yeah, um, uh, that's a very uh, valid question, Susan. Especially with a, such a large detachment, that's going to be you know heart in the mouth situation. We don't want to, by mistake, yank the whole thing out. 
very difficult and i think you and uh, you kind of handled it beautifully by using air i don't think anything else except air would have worked in that condition so bringing me back to another question when you trying to put back it uh, the strip dissimets and you want to pump put in an air bubble wouldn't it be better to do a full fill and do an inferior air docking yeah 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 definitely sir uh, in pdex and uh, you know uh, those who do demec and desec then inferior aerodotomy is already always done to avoid a pupillary block but in this case since i've done the pass you know release and all there were already small holes in the periphery through which the air uh, probably would not have caused the problem no, not in this case generally speaking somebody yes definitely definitely it's it's always particularly if your if your detachment of the decimates is inferior please do a full fill and do an inferior aerodotomy The other one is, uh, what is your take on using expansive gases when nothing else works? Long-acting gas, I did used to use a lot of it earlier. Uh, for the last, I think, two, three years, I have not used it too much uh, because I find that the air pump really helps. So the air pump is giving in pressurized air uh, over a short period of time, and that kind of helps to attach the desmos membrane already. Uh, uh, that that helps in uh, PDX and DMX because you don't have too much viscoelastic. In case of desmos detachment, you have to be careful to remove all the viscoelastic in the interface between the stoma and the desmos. If you are able to do that, the air pump can still uh, uh, you know help you attach it. But if you have any kind of retained viscoelastic, I would say that it's uh, possibly important uh, better to put in expansive gas because then you need a long period of uh, of uh, tamponade from within. Non-expansive gas. Sorry, non-expansive. Sorry, Ashwin. I I have the zone. How how are you, Doctor Chi? Hi, hi, I'm good. Can I just make a comment? Please, um, please. Do you know how the desmase detachment came about? Because uh, when I do peripheral anterior sinicare, uh, I think we need to be, the, the license of peripheral anterior sinicare, we need to be very careful how it's done. And what I used to do is like what you described, you push towards the angle and then you sweep. But I find that whenever you sweep and the peripheral anterior sinicare is severely adherent, you will rip desmase. So what I do now is I just nudge from the uh, beginning of the peripheral anterior sinicare, I just push it towards the angle. And I do that repeatedly rather than sweep because then that does not rip desmase. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I think that's, very, that's very a very valid point. Valid point. Yeah. Another point I'd like to um, take uh, take home message to the people who are watching this. If you're doing a full fill, do not send the patient home immediately. Keep the patient under your care for at least six hours. Recheck the IOP if it's very high. Burp the patient on the sit lap. Yeah. So some really cool valid tips here uh, regarding desmet. So if and 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 it's a very very common problem to have in uh, cataract surgery, and you can face these issues in even routine cases sometimes. So we really need to know these uh, procedures and tips. Because when we go on the on the ground and actually start doing these procedures, you really need to know at least. Okay, you know, Doctor Chi said this, Doctor Susan said this, Doctor Arulmani said this. You, those things really need to be in our minds when we uh, actually go down to the wire. And that's one of the reasons why TNO, TNO is doing these connect series. It's it's so important to educate the right steps, building blocks forward. Uh, moving on with our uh, talk because we still have a uh, few more presentations left. Uh, I'm going to ask Doctor. Uh, Ahmed, uh, Asaf, uh, do you want to present on your own? You you want me to play the video, Doctor Asaf? Hi, Ashwin. Hi, you, all. First of all, yes. hi. Hi, how are you? And now you can play the presentation. They can play the, the video from your side, and then I will comment uh, later Perfect. on. Perfect. Okay, done. We'll play your presentation for you. Just sharing the screen here. Let me know if uh, everybody is able to see it. Can everybody else mute? There's there's some crackling noise. I think it's coming. You're not Dr. able to see the video, Ashwin. Yeah, I'm just sharing it. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Rajshikar, Dr. Rajshikar, can you just mute your uh, this thing? It's just. Yeah. This is a conventional phaco emulsification of white cataract. Surgery started by staining with tripan blue, then puncture of the anterior capsule with a 27 gauge needle to aspirate the emulsified cortex. This was followed by plexus formation, and then quick chop technique was employed for the moderate density cataract. As you can see, everything went just fine until all of a sudden, the posterior capsule was gripped by the phaco tip. 
I realized at this moment I had a torn posterior capsule with a significant part of the nucleus that had fallen into the anterior vitreous. I kept the phaco tip inside the eye and injected dispersive OBD to prevent collapse of the anterior chamber just before pulling out of the phaco tip outside the eye. With the aid of two instruments, I tried to retrieve this part of the nucleus into the anterior chamber before it finds its way into the posterior vitreous. However, I didn't succeed as there was something in between the nucleus and the instruments. It took me about a couple of minutes until I realized I had an intact posterior capsule over the falling nuclear fragment. Most probably, this fragment reached the anterior vitreous through the area of zonular dehiscence inferiorly, not through a break into the posterior capsule. At this moment, I had to sacrifice the posterior capsule and open it with the aid of MBR. The capsule was very redundant, which was another sign of zonular weakness. Finally, I could puncture the capsule with the MVR and the second instrument, followed by injection of dispersive OVD to tamponade the vitreous. I tried to convert this iatrogenic puncture into a posterior axis, but failed due to the massive zonular weakness. With a posterior assisted levitation technique, I could bring the falling part of the nucleus into the anterior chamber above the iris plane. This was followed by injection of three piece IOL into the anterior chamber to act as a scaffold. I then continued phacomulsification after lowering the bottle height and reduction of fluidics and ultrasound settings. Of course, I injected a generous amount of OBD to protect the corneal endothelium. For the cortical remnants in the posterior fornices, pars plana anterior vitrectomy through inferior sclerotomy was applied. Limbal approach anterior vitrectomy was sometimes considered for better accessibility of the cortex in some locations. The pupil was getting down, making the procedure more complicated. However, finally, the anterior chamber was clear of vitreous and lens matter and ready for placement of the IOL into the sulcus. Oops, the capsule is very flaccid. The haptics of the IOL were placed into the sulcus one at a time, followed by optic capture into the rexus. I was happy by having the IOL stable into the sulcus after the optic capture. However, this happiness didn't last for more than a few seconds as I realized that the IOL was considerably tilted evidence by the appearance of the optic edge through the narrow pupil. I tried a few times to set the IOL in place, but every time it ended with the same notable tilt. In such a context of narrow pupil, my preferred technique of intraskeral haptic fixation would be very challenging to me, so I thought suturing the haptics of the IOL to the iris might be a better alternative. I pushed the iron optic up above the iris plane. A modified seeps or slipping knot with 10 or proline suture was employed. I always don't tight the knots until I push the iron optic back in place and make sure there is no iris tissue have been caught into the knot and the pupil is rounded again. This was followed by closure of the sclerotomies suturing the conjunctiva and finally stromal hydration of the corneal wounds before conclusion of the surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asaf, wonderful. for that wonderful video. And uh, I think we'll, we'll start a little bit of uh, uh, questions for this. Uh, I just wanted to check with you. What was the uh, reason for this uh, laxity? Was it noticed in the beginning itself or was it uh, post? Yes, a good question. The laxity of the zonies was not noticed uh, in the preoperative exam, and most probably it was iatrogenic during the surgery itself. Most probably because of the white cataract, there are some sort of zonial weakness, and this weakness may be exaggerated at the time of the surgery. So 
uh, it was a, a large part of the weakness in the inferior quadrant. So one part or a significant part of the nucleus has been escaped through this weakness under the iris into the anterior vitreous. This is most, my most uh, reasonable ex explanation for this case because the posterior capsule was completely intact uh, at the time of the surgery. Absolutely. So I wanted to check with all the panelists uh, are there any tips and tricks when you see these white cataracts to notify yourself that, hey, guys, this is going to be a very different capsule or a different lens matter or a milky white? What is the, what are those small things that you look for in these cases? Any anybody? So if you are going to be able to see uh, do a decent rexus without difficulty, that means the anterior zonules are not too bad. To judge the posterior zonules, very difficult. It's only as the case progresses. You see folds coming up in the posterior uh, uh, capsule, which is not explainable, and the whole posterior capsule is floppy. Then you understand the posterior zonules are very weak. A case where there's total zonular weakness, then you will notice the lens moving around. Pechodonosis is noticed either preoperatively or peroperatively. But when you have an isolated posterior zonule weakness, things like this will occur. We'll have to just bite it, bite the bullet and go ahead and do whatever was best possible. And whatever Dr. Ahmed done, uh, has done is fantastic. He's done multiple uh, technology techniques there to get <clears> over <throat> a very difficult situation. I would also agree, Ashwin. I think it was an excellent surgery, Dr. Ahmed. And he's given some key important take-home messages for the audience here. The first thing I think Mohan Rajan will agree is when he had the problem, he didn't remove his probe. I think that is the first most key important step where he injected viscoelastic with the second hand to maintain the anterior chamber because most times when you have the collapse is when the nucleus can be lost in a hurry. So I think that was how the surgeon's mind stays stable in those difficult times. And the second thing is, the main thing is to remove the nucleus or bring it into the anterior chamber because as we are surgeons, we know once you lose in the vitreous cavity, it's a whole new different ball game. I think so those two are very important steps. The third thing I think I shouldn't want to agree, a good eyeball would have been an option because you have a three-piece eyeball inside there. So not switching it to the iris, but apart from that, well, uh, did surgery. Thing. Anything yeah, that is good for the patient. And one more good. small thing is like, uh, he also mentioned that when he ruptured the PC, then he tried to convert it to a rexis. So again, to the for the audience, they always say any break in the rupture is in a weak area, so where it can split later on. So converting it, uh, the rupture into a posterior capsular rexis is always safe and stronger option, I think. So he's done all the three here. I think one of the important points which uh, I'd like to inform the audience is whenever you see that optic edge uh, of the uh, IOL, uh, don't presume and assume that it will be fine next day morning. In fact, more often than not, at, at least 75 to 80%, it will it actually is, be down on the retina or it will be in the mid vitreous cavity. So uh, handle it then and then. Don't try and uh, be a, you know, uh, don't try and assume things. Just handle it then and there. Make sure that you have a centered intraocular lens when you uh, exit that case. Or, or send it over to Egypt and uh, <laughs> Dr. Ahmed can take care of it. Uh, thank you very much. But I would like to comment that, uh, uh, yes, I, I agree that the glued IOL is a very good option. And, and this is actually my preferred technique for fixing the IOL. But uh, this is another way because the pupil is getting down. And uh, if I want to resort to glued IOL, I have to uh, fix iris hooks again and bring the pupil wide and then do the glued IOL. And this was at the end of the procedure, you know, this was a challenging case. So I thought this is the easier way to, to fix the IOL, but I totally agree that the glued IOL is better alternative in these cases to fix the IOL to the sclera. Can I have a comment, please? Please, Dr. Yeah. Yes. yes. So I met congratulations. You handled it very well, a very difficult and challenging situation. So two things. Um, you know, your comment about doing the glued IOL with a small pupil, uh, perhaps later when you see my videos, you can also make some comments because when I do a glued IOL, uh, when I do an intraskeroheptic fixation with the Yamani technique, which I know you do, um, I always myose the pupil, okay? And I have the lens completely in the anterior chamber. And when you see my videos, you'll see some parallel to your cases. The other comment I wanted to make is that in advanced cataracts, it's my routine to do a UBM to assess the zonules. And from the UBM, we can assess whether the zonules are intact. Just is it the anterior, is it the posterior, or is it partially gone? And I find the UBM very useful in predicting whether you're going to face weak zonules so that you'll be prepared for these cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I make a comment, Ashwin? 
please please doctor sir no no ashwin i think it's a beautiful uh, video by hamad uh, congrats uh, congratulations sir for that uh, wonderful video and wonderful concept as well but only thing is in hypermature cataract we see it commonly in our country here and you know uh, as arul was right recently when you do the rexis you know because the peripheral resistance is not there so at that time itself you know whether the zonules are weak but what i do in all hypermature cataracts is that because the the posterior zonules are likely to be weak as well and you will see that the posterior capsule is moving forward and you can see the wrinkles on the posterior capsule when half the nucleus has been removed every time you come out of the eye now and then you keep injecting viscoelastic preferably a coercive viscoelastic to fill up the bag okay so that will push the posterior capsule back and back and so that the phaco probe doesn't come in contact with your posterior capsule at all because the posterior capsule is lax and that is the reason why all these problems can occur and sometimes you can even put a ctr at that stage and make sure that you stretch the posterior capsule also so that's uh, these are suggestions i would like to make thank you Otherwise, so much that's beautiful some some of those tips are really important uh, another point i wanted to add is you know when you see these milky cataracts or milky white cataracts you sometimes see crystals these these crystals in it and those crystals are very very clear signs for me that that bag is not going to act normally and it's going to be a you know that flaccid kind of bag where you can't even poke the to do the cystotome rexus you can't even poke through that and so those are very yes. clear signs that this bag is not worth keeping in the eye and those are some things that i started to understand it's not worth keeping that bag inside the eye itself even if you want to put a rexus a uh, sulcus placed in trochlear lens don't do it in fact move over to a procedure which is more robust where you do an anterior vitrectomy clear up that zone and do a glued or a yamane or uh, what uh, emma uh, just showed and these are some of the simple basic things that are changing in these uh, challenging uh, complex cases going forward uh having said that i'm going to now hand over uh, thank you dr asaf for that beautiful video very nice sir. thank you over. very much thank i'm going to hand thank over you. to dr chi if she is here to uh where did she go she was right here yeah she's there i think mm -hmm. she's logged she logged out uh no problem uh we're going to move ahead then uh dr sir um, dr mohan would you like to go next yeah i i don't mind going Yeah, I should I share my screen? Please go ahead, sir. Able to see my screen? Able to see my screen? Yes, sir. You can start. Absolutely, we can, but we are no, it's not on presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah, I will do that. I'm going to show you two cases, and uh, of one is of a subluxated total cataract. the another one is the subluxated uh, um, iol okay is a multi piece iol and we'll see how we handle both of these the case one is a 60 year old male with a history of shuttlecock injury 20 years back and subluxated total cataract traumatic metriasis you know how the shuttlecock injuries are the shuttlecock injuries are probably the worst injuries you can ever have i can have gross deformation of the anterior segment i can have secondary glaucoma hydrodialysis traumatic cataract even posterior segment problems as well so the surgical plan was to have a flax because when i have a subluxated cataract my my comfort with the flax is catalyst is much better put a ctr then i oil either in the bag or the sulcus depending on whatever i am going to see intraoperatively and then do a sft because the patient had a traumatic midriasis as well his pupil was uh, uh, the resting pupil was almost about 7 mm you can see this is uh, you can see this uh, how these lenses moving around i know chi soon fake will show uh, lenses which are actually half in the vitreous and you know she will get it out but uh, i am a chota surgeon here but i'm just telling trying to say this is a 3 to 4 clock hours subluxated total dense cataract as well so the only way i can manage this is to He used to do a, a what do you call a, a, a femto because the femto makes my life easy in many ways. The one is it makes my rexus very easy. Okay, then it also cuts the cataract. So I do just have to pick up the rexus. So you can see that the rexus is already done, and in the area of the zone of dialysis, I'm just supporting that. So I'm just putting the main incision and pulling off that uh, capsule, and, and I'm just doing a gentle. hydro dissection and then i'm just putting two uh, uh, what do you call the uh, stab incisions 
and supporting that uh, uh, area of the zonal, um, uh, uh, what do you call the dialysis or the zonal weakness uh, with the uh, two iris hooks in that area. So I don't put that iris hooks very, very, uh, what, do you, uh, what do you call, uh, very tightly because I, because these iris hooks are uh, are uh, resting on the capsular excess. Always you have to be aware of that. So you can see that already it's a very dense cataract. And uh, whenever I come out of the eye, I inject viscoat into the eye and uh, make sure that I is because I don't want the zonules to uh, the capsule to come forward. You can see here I'm injecting viscoat or any uh, viscoelastic for the matter. I'm doing a coaxial irrigation aspiration. Again, I'm injecting uh, the helon into the anterior chamber and trying to do that. Then I'm removing the iris hooks because I want to support that by means of a CTR. It's only about three to four clock hours, you can see here. I'm putting a CTR there and then going ahead and uh, doing a, 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 a try to remove this uh, uh, remaining cortex as well. You could try to put the CTR as late as possible or as early as you want to. So I put as early as possible because I want to make sure that if the suppose there is a posterior capsule rupture, then you have a CTR in the you're in trouble. Then I put a multi-piece lens. I thought I'll initially put it in the bag. Then I thought, okay, let me be let me put it in the sulcus because this is something which I learned from David Chang as well in pseudo exfoliation. Also, I'm doing this regularly. And you can see here, uh, I'm putting this haptic in the uh, in the sulcus and capturing that optic, the, the ovalization of the anterior capsule is probably the end limit for the optic that is getting locked into the sink. I'm doing a single pass four through pupiloplasty popularized by Amar, and you can see here uh, the traumatic midriasis. Uh, of course, uh, what you call a, a first string pupiloplasty would have worked better, but I, I, I'm not very, very familiar with that technique. This technique is very easy to do and uh, it, if it works well with Amar, it works well with everybody. Uh, also, that's what Amar uh, always says and it's, it's a really a fantastic technique. Very easily doable and multiple single pass four through pupiloplasty. You can see here the lens is quite stable, but the pupil is quite large. We can't leave this pupil, okay? We used to leave this pupil about seven millimeter, but patient will have excess glare and loss of contrast vision. You know, the glass is a glare is something which really troubles them. It's like having a, a what you call refractive multifocal lens with a number of rings into the eye. So that, that's what happens. You need to make this pupil small. In fact, Amar goes one step forward and does what is called phenol pupiloplasty also for correcting astigmatism. And you can see here what I'm trying to do is I'm doing this uh, multiple throws and you need to do that repeatedly. I do a long, that is the, the, the uh, tenoproline needle and then bring it out into the other thing and bring the loops up and have the uh, um, four loops and tie the two ends of the four loops automatically it goes inside and cuts it and then the, the four loops are uh, very very stable it stays, stays and i can see the pupil is a fairly good size now and the patient is uh, also uh, doing well at the end of the surgery always uh, um, because uh, i put a suture in the main port because i want to make sure it's stable and put an air bubble there in anterior chamber and you can see this is uh, a uh, post-operative vision a six nine n six in this patient the patient is very happy no glare no symptoms no photic phenomenon or nothing like that so this is one case the second case is again a 70 year old male who had history of pico foldable a multi-piece lens ma60 lens 15 years back six nine vision he was Bother about oscillopsia. Oscillopsia is a very condition wherein the lens starts moving into the eye, and because of history of blunt trauma and pseudo exfoliation is also present, you can see here how the lens is moving in the eye. So every time he moves the eye, you can see that everything is moving around as if he has taken a couple of pegs. You can see here. So this and his vision is also not very good. Six twelve, six nine, because of the oscillopsia and the lens is not very stable as well. So what we thought was, okay, let us do, um, otherwise, you know, normally without the blue dye, we would have probably expanded these lenses and put lenses, extended incision. So that I, do, I do a pass plan, I infusion there and take the flap 0, 180 degree. I use the Ashwin Agarwal marker there. And you can see here, I put a pyrotomy there and try to bring this lens up. Okay, this lens is already gone uh, in the sense that uh, the, the lens is not gone. The, 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 we cannot fix it lens in the bag anymore make sure that i strip all the cortex and the and the and the capsule and i'm, I'm also doing a, 
because the infusion is already there i'm just doing an anterior vitrectomy to make sure that the the, the vitreous in the pupillary area is removed and uh, uh, stripping the complete uh, the lens with all the capsule remnants and then trying to exterior just like the glued eye oil catch the tip of the haptic and exteriorize it already i have created the 0 180 degree flaps there again catching the tip that is what is called the handshake technique again popularized and you can see here how i'm trying to bring it out this is already a multi piece lens because of that the multi piece lens i'm able to do that and creating the gabor shariat uh, tunnels and trying to glue, put that and then then glue the thing and the, and the patient uh, uh, and just making sure that no vitreous and anti chamber how ideally uh, you can use a tricot to make sure there's no vitreous or anything in the anti chamber put an air bubble and then make sure there is no the air bubble you put to make it dry and then put the glue the fibrin and the thrombin glue you can put that and uh, close the sterile flaps close the conjunctival flaps also and you can see how the patient behaved post operatively as well you can see that the patient and you can see how the patient the absolutely there is no movement there is no pseudo phaco donosis at all and 65 vision the patient was very very happy and you can see here uh, this is the beautiful advantage of glued eye oil because of that the steel fixation also certain amount of iris fixation also certain amount of pseudo phaco donosis is there but you can see here absolutely the, the, the lenses are so beautifully fixed there and the patient is beautiful is round and the patient is very happy with vision of 6y more importantly is oscillopsy are completely disappeared this just to show you another patient with a decentered eye oil referred to us and two or three times this patient had a we have probably had a zonal dialysis and a pcr he tried to put the lens in the sulcus okay as ashwin rightly said don't try to retain put the lens again in the sulcus this patient has been referred to us two or three times already surgery done outside you can see three sutures are already there one for the main port and two for the side ports as well you can see here what i'm trying to do is i'm just trying to exteriorize that haptic fortunately being a multi piece lens i'm able to do that i'm creating i'm doing a vertical glued um, thing because i want to make sure in this case because the haptic uh, need not be rotated all the way down so vertical you can see i am 6 and 12 o'clock i'm doing i am and uh, i'm sitting temporarily and i'm doing the vertical glued i will flap and uh, we can use an anti ray chamber maintainer or you can use a pass plana infusion if you are uh, scared of using a pass plana infusion you can put an anti ray chamber maintainer the trocar anti ray chamber maintainer is also available i have also developed the anti ray chamber maintainer in association with apasomi people with a 23 gauge uh, system with a side flow as well and just to try making sure that the vitreous is make sure that the vitreous is always removed before you uh, and also the all the cortical and the capsular remnants is removed and again using the micro incision forceps don't extend the incision just to make small incisions here and there the micro forceps the glued eye oil forceps try to catch the tip of the haptic exteriorize it and you now try to glue it and this patient again did very well and well centered and had a good visual acuity as well so this is just to show you the one month post op three months post op absolutely just like a pc i oil in this patient thank you uh, tnoa i would like to thank ashwin and uh, nishant uh, uh, for moderating this session and uh, this tnoa connect series as you know we are doing it the, uh, in association with the major institutes in tamil nadu as a president of tnoa i would like to thank each and every one of you this connect series is nothing but uh, you know all the ophthalmic institutes are are in tamil nadu and this week it's uh, it's our honor to do it with dr agarwal sai hospital thank ashwin for getting the international faculty also our top faculty for this challenging cases video symposium thank you again thank you so much uh, mohan sir you've always been an inspiration and i think some of the points that you brought up in this uh, topic today especially you know retaining the same intraocular lens because the intraocular lens is okay it's just the bag and the zonules that have somehow given way and you can really capitalize on you know using only two small incisions and two small sclerotomies that's all you need to actually do to uh, you know retain the same intraocular lens and one of the points which actually go prelude to this whole concept is whenever you have a challenging case initially and you're thinking it may last may not last please put a three piece lens I always just put a three piece lens because you never know when that case can actually come back to you or come back to somebody else at some point and you can really retain that same intraocular lens and do either a glued or yamani whichever technique of your choice but a three piece lens is the key over there uh so in these challenging cases that's one of the top, top tips one of the yeah, points i would like to ask 
Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Ashwin, we, we, yeah, definitely panel discussion I want, but Ashwin, I would like to reiterate that point. Nowadays, I've started putting for all my pseudo exfoliation patients three piece lenses. Okay. And I do the David Chang's technique. I, sometimes I put the lens to the haptic in the, in the sulcus and capture that the missing because the pseudo phacotonosis, the, the stability is much better. Or you can put it in the bag as well. Because sometimes, many times, you see that after 10 years or five years or whatever it is, the whole lens. Um, the back complex goes into the vitreous cavity. And if it's a single piece lens, you need to extend the incision, take it out, and it's a really a messy affair. But if it's a multi-piece lens, you can just bring it up, do a vitrectomy, bring it up, and remove the capsular bags and everything, and uh, uh, glue it the way I have shown. So that's what I wanted to give uh, this thing. So multi-piece lens for pseudo exfoliation is the way to go. Perfect. We have another minute or so if the panel wants to uh, you know, give a comment or so, because we do have Four or five videos. Um, I think I'd the like to say, when you have a pseudo exfoliation, does it make sense just to put a CTR? Is that more important or is it more important to put in a three piece lens? I guess putting in a CTR is quite important. That doesn't save you from the possibility of the bag dropping in the later stages. So, CTR and a three piece lens in the sulcus and a reverse optic capture may be the best way to go. Uh, Dr. So Chi Soon Pek say something about that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I routinely do put in a CTR, but at present, I'm still not putting in uh, a three-piece lens. I put the lens in the bag and I, I just pray. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. that, you know, the zonules don't go off so fast. But I, I think you're right because this is a progressive disease. And uh, maybe uh, one day we might just straight away do a intraskeroheptic fixation and not wait for this to happen. <laughs> So if I, I think it's it's about grading it and also looking at the age of the patient at that age point. Of the patient. Age yeah, of so the couple of things that actually play out, uh, but I'll take it case to case basis. Uh, also, what happens is I, I go in for the glued in case it's a very bad progress, already a progressed condition. I don't think there's a point in waiting because that pseudophacodonosis post-operatively is terrible for the patient and it's too lax for the patient to actually have clear vision, especially when they're moving the head and that clarity is not there. It's like it, it moves a lot more. So that uh, really does not give the wow factor to the patient. And that wow factor is something that, you know, the intraskeletal haptic really brings to the table. And that's one of the changes that's moved in my practice, at least. And that's why, you know, first day post-op, really having a clear cornea as well and having a good uh, clarity is, uh, is extremely important. But... Having said that, I know that, you know, everybody has been waiting for Dr. Chi's presentation. So I'm really going to move on because we really have five or six more presentations left and we have less time. We want to keep to time as well. So Dr. Chi, uh, the whole moment has been, the whole presentation is all about you. So we're all waiting for your presentation. Go ahead. Dr. Uh, Chi, all please, please play my video. I will play Thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank Come you. I've got you waiting. Just let me know if the... Hello everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Ashwin for including me and I'll be speaking on Morgagnian sorrows. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. Our first patient presented with poor vision in his left eye due to strabismic amblyopia and you can see a Morgagnian cataract here and the missing zonules on UBM and in addition, he's a highly myopic eye. I initiated the capsulorexis by piercing with a 27 gauge needle. You can see just how shaky that lens is. And my mistake was not to aspirate. And you can see that all this uh, liquefied cortex was spilling over into the anterior chamber, which I had to then aspirate. And then I was doing a bimanual capsulorexis using two non tooth forceps. And I decided to inject and to fill the capsular bag, which was really very uh, wobbly and collapsed with viscoelastic, and then I was progressing well, and I thought I completed the capsular axis, applied my iris hooks, applied some tension to open the uh, capsular axis a little further, 
and I realized I had ripped the capsule rexis, as you can see here. I'm then removing this nucleus now with the help of indentation by a cotton bud externally on the sclera and using a biomano technique, I bring this nucleus, which is really quite large, into the anterior chamber, which is filled with dispersive viscoelastic. I create space under the nucleus by injecting dispersive viscoelastic and then I'm going with reduced parameters, taking care not to scratch the optic surface with the chopper. And once I removed uh, the nucleus, I inject viscoelastic again to the anterior chamber. I've marked 2 mm, just a little more than that because it's high myope uh, behind the limbus. Remove the capsule bag, it's really no use. I cannot insert any capsule tension ring into this wobbly bag. And then I did a bimanual vitrectomy with the help of 50% diluted transino acetonite and then iridectomy superiorly and bend my 27 gauge needle going 2 mm from the marked point, which is 2 mm from the limbus, a little more than 2 mm. I then uh, push the 27 gauge needle into the eye and thread the haptic into the ball of the 27 gauge needle. This happens to be a JJB AR 40 m and you can see I'm doing this for a diametrically opposite site. Again, 2 mm from the marked point, which is just over 2 mm from the limbus because of the high myope and thread the haptic into the ball of the 27 gauge needle and then pull on the two needles uh, simultaneously to retrieve the haptics. I then flange the, in, the one to my left and then flange the one to my right, 3mm from the point of the end of the haptic check to ensure that the lens is well centered and then push the flange into the scleral tunnel, make sure it's buried and then remove the scholastic. Post-operatively, he was able to see 615. Our second case is a 60-year-old gentleman with poor vision in his left eye since 15 years old following trauma. Again, a highly myopic eye, hand movement vision from a Morganian cataract, and you can see UPM showing missing zonules. This time I thought I was smarter, I'll do a femtosecond laser capsulotomy, and you can see here it cut through the capsule, yes, on maximum power, but it did not cut through the subcapsular fibrosis. And so I'm now teasing the subcapsular fibrosis with two non tools MST forceps. I'm providing the counter forceps I pull. As you can see, there are really no zonules in this area. And I've succeeded. I removed the capsule, but I realized that this bag is really collapsed and stuck one capsule to another. And I'm not going to be able to insert a capsule tension ring into this capsular bag with the parent capsules. So I've manipulated this huge nucleus into the anterior chamber that's filled with dispersive viscoelastic using a mushroom or barrette manipulator together with the Sinsky hook. I now inject a three-piece LL under the nucleus onto the iris in the anterior chamber. And then I do phaco very carefully with reduced parameters. And you can see that the femtosecond laser has indeed fragmented the nucleus somewhat, making uh, surgery uh, easier and uh, I can use less power. And now I've removed the nucleus, filled it up with uh, dispersive viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, bend my 27 gauge needles, make sure there's no vitreous now, by manual vitrectomy with a 20, 30, 23 gauge vitrector, and with the help of diluted trimacinal acetonide, again 27 gauge needle that's been bent, 2 mm from the mark point, which is just over 2 mm posterior to the limbus, thread the haptic of the OL in the anterior chamber into the bar of the 27 gauge needle. Now I release the needle and then I repeat the procedure to, for a diametrically opposite location with the 27 gauge needle entering the eye 2 mm, just over 2 mm posterior to the limbus in this very high myope and thread the haptic into the ball of the 27 gauge needle. And once I've done that, I retrieve the two needles simultaneously and I like to do the one on my left first, grasp the haptic and flange it about 3 mm from the tip, making sure there is no viscoelastic there. And I repeat that for the diametrically opposite location 
in this case here, I'm doing a PI now and ensure that the lens is well centered. And then I now close up that pupil because he had some trauma there previously that probably was a laceration that was sutured with some loss of the iris. I then suture up to do that pupiloplasty. So at one month post-op, you can see he actually achieved 615 unaided vision. In conclusion, while gagnon cataracts are challenging, the liquefied cortex and capsular fibrosis make capsorexis difficult. It's lethal when combined with zonular adhesions. Dense nucleus may not always be small, but it's often mobile. The Yamani intraskeral haptic fixation saves the day. Be prepared. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Uh, panel, I, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, do you guys do Yamane? And uh, if so, which intraocular lens do you use? And uh, I, I, before we go to Dr. Chi. Uh, yeah, I think uh, before the panel, I don't use, uh, do Yamane, so I can't answer that. But I think uh, all of the panel is going to need some time for their hearts from their mouth as to go to the chest <laughs> before we can start answering. Jeez, <laughs> acrobatics, that's fabulous. <laughs> See, literally acrobatics, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> madam, I, I, I just wanted one, I would ask you one question, madam. You have a lens which is there in the anterior chamber in front of the iris. On top of that, you have a dense nucleus also. Because both the patients, I think you showed were high myopia, you had a good anterior chamber, you got away with it. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't know whether it's a good idea to have, suppose you have an hematropic or hypermetropic eye, to have a morganic character with the lens in the anterior chamber and a lens dense nucleus also and doing a phaco, your cornea will go for a six. I want your opinion on that. I think you brought up a very relevant point and it's important that your cornea is healthy. So it is my routine to look at the endothelial cell count before I start the case because I routinely do endothelial cell count for these advanced cataracts to see how much acrobatics I can do when everything fails. So if the chamber is not deep, then I wouldn't uh, do this kind of technique. It would be a bit uh, uh, unkind to the cornea, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think it's a good point to think. Uh, what, what technique would uh, the panel do in case they have the situation and they have placed the intraocular lens? Would you do a small incision or would you do a, what, what, would, what would be the preferred technique in case you didn't have the deep chamber which you had? Uh, anybody from the panel can take that question. Even Dr. Ahmed. I think they are wonderfully managed. And uh, I agree with Mohan sir. This particular case, the nucleus was large. I have done a couple of cases in which the, you have these uh, hypermature cataracts, Morgagnian cataracts, where the nucleus is actually small, yeah. in which I put the IOL and I have done the phaco emulsification. But as she's already mentioned, she has done the femto uh, cataract. So that is actually even help her break down or soften the nucleus a little bit more. Maybe that could be an added advantage in this particular case. Another amazing point was I like the way she did the bimanual rexis. That is one thing that I also have done in these cases where the zonules are weak. She actually gives a counter traction. So that prevents the further uh, losing away the entire nucleus into the vitreous cavity when you complete the rexis. Absolutely. One question that comes is do you, uh, when you do this femto uh, cataract uh, on these subluxated cases, uh, when you're putting these capsular hooks or these iris hooks, do they tear out because of that? I mean, we've always heard this concept that the femto rexis versus a manual rexis is very different and so on and so forth. Have you had a tear out in these femto rexis? Absolutely not. So the femto rexis are not necessarily weaker than the uh, manual rexis, not anymore. And one you have to watch that. your settings. If your energy settings are actually such that the vertical spot spacing is further, which is, has been studied, all right, then you do not have that irregular edge you know, the posted stem kind of edge to your capsulotomy. So actually a faster capsulotomy is better. So if you have a very advanced cataract, what you want to do is not to decrease the spot spacing, but you want to increase the energy to the maximum. Yeah. One more basic question, because I don't have experience with femto cataract. We showed one subluxated cataract, and these cataracts, the anterior chamber might be uneven. So, question is whether you will get a even part throughout in these subluxated cataracts. Uh, yeah, I can... 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but there's a sound that's echo, echo, echo. Oh, echo. You just oh. mute your. Yeah, I'll just make a quick point. But Please. like as as uh, Ashwin pointed out, when from a center where we do more subsidized and free surgery, in these kind of scenarios, we get away very much with an SICS. And we also have a corresponding three-piece lens in the rigid segment also. Aurolab makes such a kind of a lens where we have the three-piece component. Right. And the same right. Yamane technique works very well there also. So that's a quick point. Sorry for my audio disturbance. I'll mute myself. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Achekar. Anything on the cut when it comes to uh, the... Yes, uh, uh, because uh, the Femto goes by the OCT, even in a tilted cataract, you will get a good rexis. But as Dr. Chi showed, if you have some um, capsular fibrosis, it's not going to cut through that, irrespective of what energy settings you put in. So you can cut the capsule if you have the right uh, settings. And you really have to do nothing more because the OCT is the template on which the rexis is being planned. So there's no issue at all with this. And also you should increase the offset in a subluxated cataract, increase the offset both uh, in front as well as underneath the, the capsule. And also another thing is within a hyper mature, mature cataracts, don't try to, because it's not a free floating rexis. Please understand. Don't try to pull the rexis. If you try to pull the rexis, you will tear the rexis in a femto. So always try to, because there are skip areas. As uh, Chi, Madam um, um, uh, Chi Sun Fake was uh, showing that, the skip areas you need to ma make sure that they, you do a proper rexis in those skip areas and try to remove that. You try to pull it out. And those areas are very weak and they can extend into the posterior capsule and you can have a PCR as well. Um, yes, this is where uh, I would disagree with uh, Mohan. Um, almost 100% of my rexes are free floating. And only in complicated cataracts where you see wrinkles on the capsule or you have a, a, a calcification or sub capsular fibrosis, you're going to have difficulty. Otherwise, in a routine cataract, it's 100% free floating. No, no, no. I'm not talking about a routine cat. I'm not talking about a hyper mature, yes. mature cat. Hyper mature again, again, the question here is wrinkles, calcification, subcapsular fibrosis. Absence of that, however hyper mature the cat tract is, the capsule will free flow. I always stain the capsule in case of white cataract with the film to second laser. You have to stain the, still you have to stain the capsule with trepan blue so you can identify those tags and uh, incomplete cut. Uh, very carefully, yes. Really, really valid points for femto cataracts. So, guys, whoever is watching this, and if you are getting into femto, uh, you know, just call the panel here. They will solve all your problems, or you can just send the cases over to them. Either which way. <laughs> uh, moving on, I think we have still four, five presentations more. And I'm going to, uh, Dr. Chi, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next series. And, uh, thank you. I'll be here. <laughs> Please, thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Gaurav Lutra. He was not able to make it, but Dr. Gaurav Lutra is next. I am going to sh share my screen to show his presentation. Hello, everyone. And uh, this is Dr. Gaurav Lutra from Jiratu. I would like to thank DNOA and uh, Dr. Ashwin Agarwal for inviting me uh, for this session, uh, uh, prestigious session. And I will be showing one challenging case. Uh, I would like to share my screen. So this was a patient with uh, ICL for almost nine years, uh, bilateral ICL, and she developed a significant severe uh, anterior uveitis in both eyes over the last few months. Uh, due to COVID, she dropped out of follow-up and uh, came back again next time with a uh, cataract and uh, the uveitis was managed properly. And uh, she developed a significant cataract in both eyes, more in one eye, which was uh, to be operated after the uveitis had been um, kept quiet for about two months. So this is how it went. And there were some learning lessons, which I wanted to share. <laughs> So when we decided to operate this patient, she had significant astigmatism. So we decided to remove the cataract and the ICL and replace it with a toric lens. She's a high myo, and we wanted to correct the astigmatism and make her as good for distance as possible. So 
there were a few things which we had not anticipated. One was that the, while we did anticipate that the pupil will not dilate easily, but it was a very rigid pupil and it was a little challenging to explant the ICL as uh, normally we normally don't face such situations with a good dilated pupil that the foot plates come out easily. Here we use the benefit of uh, hydro implant, hydro under fluid because we did not want to put viscoelastic at this point. So I was using infusion from my left hand and using a dialer in the other hand to help explant the lens. Uh, we wanted to stain the capsule as it was an intubacent cataract and once you put in viscoelastic, the staining process becomes more challenging. So uh, under the pressure of infusion, uh, with the chamber formed nicely, uh, we managed to get the ICL out of the sulcus anterior to the iris. And you can see that through the small pupil, it was a little challenging, but eventually using the holes in the ICL, we were able to manage that. Now came the task of uh, staining the capsule, uh, which we did uh, at this point itself under the ICL, as we wanted to have a good stain of the capsule for uh, doing a good rexis. After this, the dye was washed out and the ICL was explanted as is usually done. And uh, you see a big PI there. This patient had developed in small iris Bombay for which a yak iridotomy was done, a small one, but it expanded. Now I will pause it here and you will see that we are planning to decompress this lens because it's an intumescent lens and we want to decompress this lens uh, before we proceed with the rexis uh, as we do with all intumescent cataracts. I'm going in with a 26 gauge needle and I'm planning to do a decompression so that at the moment I touch it, you see that because of the significant intumescence, the lens goes into a flag sign. Now, we had not anticipated this, but we had to deal with it. And luckily, because it was a young patient uh, who was only about 35 years old, we could remove the cortex. And after this, the task of fashion mm -hmm. access on both sides. So, uh, this was done using micro access forceps, uh, as you can see there. Now, we had to implant a lens. It had been planned to put a toric lens, and we were wondering whether we should still go ahead because the access was broken. But we realized that uh, we, we check whether the lens uh, goes into the back. And we checked on all sides and luckily the flaps of the capsule on all sides were anterior to the lens. And uh, this patient on follow-up has continued to have good positioning of the ice of the lens. Now this was a learning lesson. And so when we had the second eye to be operated for the same patient, we um, were able to make a better plan. And so in the second eye, we noticed that the vault was almost uh, negligible. And uh, however, this was going to be a challenge because we did not want, although this was not intumescent, but we wanted this surgery to be uneventful. So we decided to make a change in the plan and went ahead with a plan for a femto-assisted cataract surgery, just in case uh, we have a complication. And uh, we combined that with LRIs to correct the astigmatism this time. And uh, the planning is a little challenging because uh, you have to <coughs> ensure that the landmarks of the lens are correct uh, because the OCT on the laser machine does not detect the correct uh, landmarks. It's not used to an ICL in the eye. So once you do the OCT scanning, uh, you will realize that the machine will you know, get the corneal parameters a little incorrect and also get, so it gets confused, but then you can manually uh, you know, them. Most importantly, the anterior capsule is detected incorrectly and that has to be corrected. And even the iris plane is detected incorrectly. The pupil size may be detected incorrectly. So you can see there that we are making changes to the pupil diameter. We are making changes to the limbus as well. And then to the anterior capsule and then correcting for cyclotorsion. And now we have our landmarks correct and we decide that we now can start the laser process. So once we have all the landmarks in place, we are all set. And... Uh, now we are all set to fire the laser. So you'll be able to very soon see that there's the capsule automy done. Now this was the challenge because getting the correct capsule automy and complete capsule automy in such eyes is not going to be easy. But once this was done, uh, we could hold our breath and we were hoping for a good uh, rexis there. But we would only know once the ICA was expanded whether we got the correct rexis. And uh, it is a very, very refined way of doing it. It's an improvisation. The femtosecond laser was not originally made to deal with such eyes. So yeah, we can now go ahead with explanting the ICL. It's of course much easier to expand the ICL here because we have an adequate pupil. And you have to be careful that you don't uh, play around much with the Absolute tag which has been created from the excess. So you can do it gently with under the amount of the school asking. And then getting the ICL out. Now you 
can understand that we were using a smaller incision than in the first time, but the ICL having lived in the eye for almost nine years, and it tends to degrade, the material tends to degrade properly and can tear like this sometimes. So you have to have a 3.5 millimeter, now enlarging the incision from a 3 to the 3.5, and we will go with a second attempt with ICL holding forceps, so hand on hand technique, and this time probably we will be able to get it out more easily but in the process the pupil has come down a little bit but we still managed to find that the excess was perfect and it was victory because the laser was able to get to a good job it was a complete free floating rexus uh, and next time we have an intumescent cataract with an icl in place we will surely want to do a femto assisted rexus to avoid a situation like you saw in the previous case now once this was done it became much easier because it's a soft cataract and we were able to actually get the cataract out fairly fast and then once that was done we were able to put in the lens it's a thickness lens because it's a high myopic eye it's a minus powered lens which we're putting there and we've done the lri so the astigmatism will get corrected as well and uh, luckily this patient did well we used a hydro implantation technique for implanting this lens as well and i think it was a very refined good procedure so the take home message probably is that we can actually innovate and improvise and do a good job uh, when you think on the go and uh, this technique can be useful for uh, many of us who do cataract surgery with uh, icls as we have lots of patients who have icls in their eyes now and they will come back to us with a cataract in 10 15 20 years anyway so with that i would like to thank all of you and thank you for inviting me uh, thanks ashwin and tnm Beautiful. That was a wonderful video and a very important topic as well. But just in interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and show one more presentation, which is a pre-recorded one, and then we'll talk about both of them together so that we, uh, you know, we, we, we're That's keeping right. to time as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> show Dr. Ashraf's video. Uh, hi, Ashwin. Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be among you all. And thanks, Ashwin, for this uh, great uh, invitation. Today, I'm going to talk about a video case of very nice case for how to convert the vision from hand motion to 0.6. It's a mystery uh, for uh, vision. Is it moving? Yeah, but I don't know why the audio is... This uh, mystery uh, case, either you replace this IOL with a PMA lens or you do a many technique, can approve a four point fixation of PMA clear IOLs or you put an anterior chamber IOL. So once I, I very important uh, uh, thing that I usually uh, like to uh, think about is uh, when you uh, start this case, what you are seeing on the slit limb, it is different completely than what you feel inside the eye. So uh, I do the paracentesis where I can go to manage this case. So this is steps because I don't know first what is this IOL, it is a hard or a three piece. But when I go inside the eye, I found that it's a three piece, so I'm going to cut it into uh, two pieces, but very important to protect the cornea in these cases because it's an older trauma and uh, you, are, you want to uh, preserve the endothelium for a lot of maneuvers you are going to do it. So first you bring your IOL in the anterior chamber carefully because uh, there may be a lot of adhesions from the old previous uh, eye surgery. Once you succeed to put the IOL inside the anterior chamber above the level of the iris, you start to cut this IOL with this maneuver. You hold it with the mic forceps first, then with special 
scissor for cutting of this IOL. I succeed to cut it into nearly or completely uh, half uh, pieces. But holding the IOL, you can give you a good control for this uh, cutting. Once you have succeeded, you bring it piece by piece outside the eye. And this is your first tip. You remove this high oil. Then after you, you remove the second piece, you start to deal with the rest of the case. I don't see a red reflex, but I don't know, know also if this hole is a phimosis of the anterior capsule or there is an opening of the posterior capsule. So injecting this cool dispersive under, inside this opening and under the uh, fibrosis make me feel that there is a new posterior capsule. And this is just the anterior capsule. But there is no vitreous at all in the anterior chamber. With a micro scissor, I start to cut this fibrous tissue bit by bit because I want to preserve the bag or even not the full bag, but the recess of the anterior and the posterior. So I cut it till I reach a clear area. And with the scissor, I can feel what, what I feel. I can feel there is a amalgam of a cortex inside the recess of the anterior and posterior. Injecting with the cannula, I can feel what I'm going to do in this case. So, once I felt that this uh, fibrous band, it is just central and the rest of the uh, area is uh, anterior and posterior attached to each other and uh, full of remnant of the cortex. The, at this, uh, at this uh, point, I took my decision to go with the double weight cannula, I didn't go for irrigation aspiration because I don't need any high pressure maneuvers inside the eye because I want to don't entangling the vitreous in my operation. So cutting more and more, this way I'm trying to open the two leaflets of the anterior and the posterior uh, capsule to have a recess where I can remove the rest of the uh, cortex and move this central part fiber spent bit by bit with a micro scissor at a, at the point after I cut it from uh, at, at least half of this uh, fibrous band I start to use a bi manual technique this bi-manual technique, holding the fibrous tissue with the forceps and with the scissor, I am completing the rest of the central part, like the retina surgeon when he deal with uh, the uh, fibrous tissues above the retina. So dealing with this in a bi-manual way, make me uh, cut it completely. So this, uh, this, uh, at this point, I start to see that the complete opening of the posterior capsule, and you should remove all the cortex in the recess. It, it is not, uh, not acceptable that you implant at this stage. You should remove all the cortex 360 degrees between the two leaflets of the old trauma of this arm. It's not an easy, it takes time because the hydration will go to inflate, inflate the cortex and you are going to succeed it to take it bit by bit till you remove all the cortex in the recess between the anterior and the posterior capsule. Slowly, I have no vitreous at all till now because I'm controlling the pressure inside the eye with no aggressive movements. No vitreous, the patient is for sure on general anesthesia and also controlling the pressure, the blood pressure uh, inside uh, uh, systemically uh, because 
it's it's open to circuit so, so I, I succeeded to remove all the cortex indices and the red reflex now is totally complete so inflating the bag uh, the tourists and the sulcus for a second implantation of a three-piece IOL uh, inside the bag it's sorry inside the sulcus with uh, making the centration of this IOL make me feel uh, succeed to implant this uh, this IOL closing all the sutures okay I found the patient uh, 0.3 uh, uncorrected uh, visual acuity point 0.3 and you can see in this photo how it converted from hand motion to point 0.3 but I follow up the patient because I'm going to remove the Totally satisfied at this stage. And in your mind, mind, you are dealing with a challenging case. Put all your plans in your mind before surgery. Do not hesitate. Do not raise the expectation of the for the patient when it's complicated case. And always prepare all your tools uh, with you. Uh, thank you, Ashvin, and I was uh, wanted to be with you, but I'm still in Dubai in another meeting. So um, I hope that you like the case and uh, see you all soon. Thank you so much. Incredible stuff, Ashwin. Incredible. Yeah, that was a really challenging case, and I think handled it really well. Uh, I think we'll we'll do uh, one or two one question or two questions max, and we'll show the last presentation of uh, Dr. Samresh after this. Uh, questions. Just to add on, uh, I think what all he did was uh, nice how he inflated the bag to create space. I think we can use the cutter also in these cases to get a space to, uh, beyond the area of the fibrosis, just to get the uh, nick and then go inside and makes it a little easier. So you. And, 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 and would you use this cutter from posterior or from the anterior? Uh, this particular case, anterior. Anterior. Yeah. The, the only problem with the cutter is that in, uh, you need to have a little more control because sometimes you can, you can, uh, you can uh, because it's, uh, both the capsules are fused and if you uh, uh, probably face the cutter uh, down or side base probably, not down, uh, otherwise you can open up the PC as well. Right. That's, that's an issue here. Dr. Chi, one would you quick handle point, that? Ashwin. One quick point on that. When they are using a cutter, most of the anterior segment surgeons continue to use that high cut rate, roughly it will allow around 1000 to 1500 an anterior vitrectomy machine. They have to bring it down to 200, 250 cuts, 300 cuts per minute, and that will cut better, these kind yeah. of thick membranes. So Very that uh, most of the anterior segment surgeons should know. They have to reduce the cut rate. To get to these kind of thick membranes. Very, very bad. The cutter would have done it very fine. The cutter would have done it very fine. He had it, uh, um, he did that bimanual um, cutting. I was thinking a cutter would have done it a bit simpler than that. Uh, Dr. Chi, Dr. Asma, any points from your side? I think if it's a fresh case, like, you know, one or two months after I've had to deal with such cases of phimosis, I normally would actually peel the sub capsular fibrosis off from the anterior capsule by manually. And then after that, enlarge the capsular axis and put in a CTR. Now, if this is like, you know, years down the line, then I would have put in my viscoelastic through that opening and inflated the bag and then started the rexus from beyond the, the fibrosis because the area of fibrosis was really central. And then I would have just torn around the fibrosis instead okay. of getting stuck inside the fibrosis. Okay. And then you can even insert the LL into the capsular bag, maybe a tension ring even after removing all the cortex like what he did. Absolutely. Uh, I, think, uh, I think if I were Ashraf at uh, that situation, I might have another plan just to uh, remove move the lens inside the anterior chamber and trying to cut all the those uh, 
plug, fibrous plug behind the lens and then fix the lens to the sclera by either the wood iron or the amalgam technique. So I believe there is no way, there is no reason to exchange the lens uh, unless there is a significant amitropia, for example, which is you cannot make sure. But uh, if I were, I would like to keep the lens inside the eye, not to remove it. Fair enough. I also would have done that. Of course, it was a three piece, I would. Yes. I, I, I think these are extremely challenging cases and, uh, you know, to handle them, especially because the primary surgery and then you're doing the secondary surgery. So always a secondary surgery is going to be more difficult than the primary one. So that's why, you know, I keep telling whatever you can do in that first surgery, just do it right then and there. Don't, even if it's a pupilloplasty, oh, it might close down. It will never close down. Just do it. It's going to be better than you can imagine. So uh, having said that, I'm going to showcase the last presentation for the day and then we'll call it a close. I might uh, just... Think we've, all, we've all seen this presentation. Uh, but, Samresh, uh, but it's a great video though. Yeah, uh, Samresh. Welcome to the 64th Annual Film Festival Awards of the OSCRS. Sir Crompton, Dr. Susie McHolland, Dr. Hithard Kaufman, Dr. Juliana Turner, Dr. Michelle Tram. Well, it's time to find out who the lucky winner is tonight. And now, without much ado, I would like to invite on stage the very talented Dr. Susie McCollin. Oh, and winner is... Thinking out of the bag. Tackling the narrow anterior segment. So tell us what your film is all about. Well, it all started with the challenge of performing cataract surgery in advanced angle closure glaucoma, a bugbear in successful visual and anatomical rehabilitation. An anteriorly displaced capsulolenticular complex associated with laxity of zonules or an anteriorly rotated ciliary body can cause forward bulge of the iris, shallowing of the anterior chamber and narrowing of the anterior chamber angle. Removal of the lens to create more space is often the treatment. But there are some cases of long-standing advanced angle closure glaucoma where despite a successfully placed IOL in the capsular bag, the chamber still remains shallow and the disease continues to progress relentlessly. But why think out of the bag? Have we considered that the capsulozonular anatomy may sometimes be the real culprit? Remember, the stability of the capsular bag is a result of interactions between the capsule, the zonular supports and the ciliary body region. Some eyes may have lax zonules or an anteriorly rotated ciliary body. It is then that the IOL within the bag may actually become the villain. Then what do you suggest to achieve stable IOL fixation, improve the anatomy of the anterior segment and yet not sacrifice the capsular bag? Again, just think out of the bag. The classical technique of optic capture involves placing the haptics in the capsular bag and capturing the optic through the posterior capsular axis. Instead, we propose the following technique for long-standing advanced angle closure glaucoma. The cataractus lens is removed. Now, a manual posterior capsular axis is created. Next, the haptics of a three-piece foldable IOL are implanted in the ciliary sulcus. The IOL optic is then slid through both the anterior and the posterior capsular axis. Indeed, we can see very well how the optic is locked in. Let's look at this patient with a long-standing angle closure glaucoma and a cataract. 
as any diligent cataract surgeon would do, surgery is performed adhering to all the principles of the slow motion technique. A single piece foldable IOL is gently placed inside the capsular bag. And in most eyes, this would do the trick. Alas, in this eye, the entire capsular bag with the IOL is bulging forward. The anatomy of the already narrow anterior segment worsened. Notice the shallow anterior chamber, the convex iris configuration, a closed angle and an anteriorly rotated ciliary body. The same patient now comes for his second eye surgery. Following posterior capsulorexis, a three-piece IOL is chosen over a single-piece IOL. The haptics positioned into the ciliary sulcus. And the optic is slid behind both the anterior and the posterior capsulorexis margins. Can you see how the iris has fallen back? The anterior chamber has deepened. The angle is no longer crowded. And more importantly, look how the ciliary body, which was rotated anteriorly, has now fallen back to its normal orientation. By placing the haptics in the sulcus, we make sure that the IOL is no longer dependent on the capsulozonular integrity for its anatomical support. Yet, unlike conventional ciliary sulcus fixation, the bulk of the IOL is positioned well away from the uveal tissue. The icing on the cake, fusion of the capsular margins, will ensure IOL stabilization and a reduction of visual axis obscuration. What are the other indications of this technique? We all come across situations such as pseudo exfoliation, no zonular weakness, securely placed IOL, only to see the entire capsular bag dislocating due to progressive zonular weakness. So in a sense, the haptic stabilized in the ciliary sulcus and the optic lying both behind the anterior and posterior capsular axis margin will anchor the capsular bag. This will give unparalleled stability and should reduce the late IOL capsular bag complex dislocations. But doctor, you certainly must acknowledge that this technique is not easy. Although technically demanding, we believe that it is worth all the effort. To better demonstrate the concept, we created a model of the eye using the latest 3D printing technology. Here, the IOL is snugly fit in the bag, but look, zonules are lax. See how the entire capsular bag is getting displaced forward, pushing the iris into the angle. Instead, with this technique, the haptics are firmly supported in the ciliary sulcus. Now there is a whole new system where the IOL stabilizes the capsulozonular complex. Our early clinical experience with the technique shows good results. Further validation will help redefine the paradigms for management in severe, chronic, narrow anterior segment. So what we judges learn from this film, that in cases of really long-standing advanced angle closure glaucoma, performing a planned posterior capsular axis, the haptics fixed in the ciliary sulcus with subsequent optic capture through the anterior and posterior capsular axis achieves superior bag zonular stability. This also means that we now have an opportunity to restore the anatomy of the narrow anterior segment in these extremely challenging cases. Most of all, this video reminds us that solutions to problems can be achieved through a change in perspective. Just think out of the bag. I think that, uh, that that's a really good final video and, and we wanted to have a few comments from the panel, please, uh, as well as Dr. Chu, uh, Dr. Chi and uh, Asaf as well, please. <clears throat> I think it's a great concept. I've tried it myself because I think Abe has spoken about this technique uh, over a year ago. But the difficulty is getting the posterior capsulorexis perfectly centered so that your RL remains centered. Because if you were to think of what the UBM images would be, if you had a slight decentration of your posterior capsulorexis, then your haptics, one of them would be eroding into the cerebral body and chafing the iris because it's decentered. 
So does, I think it's it, not always achievable, uh, even in you know practice. Does it work? I mean, so I think one of the points that came up in the previous discussion was uh, using a cutter. Does it work as well if you use a, a vitrectomy cutter to make that posterior capsule open? Does it work? I, I'm, I've never tried this technique for. Uh, and placing an intraocular lens through a, uh, you know, through a cutter-based opening. Well, I mean, in, in these cases, you can actually preserve the interior vitreous phase. So I'm not sure if you use a vitrector, whether you'll be able to achieve the same. Yeah. yeah with the vitreous cutter, no, you will not be able to uh, retain I don't think it's controlled. And I don't think the cutting is controlled as well. Yes, uh, you will not be able to control. Now, also, it's very difficult, especially in a pseudo-exfoliation case, when there is a zonular weakness, laxity of the posterior capsule, very difficult to do a posterior capsule rexis. So... So we need the femto posterior capsule rexis. <laughs> That's a good one. You have opened the eye. I've done uh, that uh, op opening the eye and doing the small pupils and all. You were done with the malignant ring, madam? Yes, I've done all that. But, you know, I, I don't think it's really approved to do posterior capsule rexis. And also whether or not the imaging system allows us yes. to, you know, cut that deeply. Yeah. yeah it's a safety. It's a good idea. Yeah. If, Ashwin, yeah. It's a good idea if you can just lock the lens, as I told in my video, the, put the lens in the haptic and lock it in the anterior capsule itself. That itself makes sure that, you know, the, the lens is a little posterior and prevents this UGH syndrome and also the long-term centration is also maintained. But the posterior capsule is something which I knew I have learned here today. It is a little more difficult technique. I also, yeah. I mean, I want the panel's opinion on this as well. I think the main cause of the problem is the posterior positive pressure that's coming in. And, and that is the real cause of this whole uh, system. Uh, I mean, the concept of, of, you know, actually removing that anterior vitreous by doing a uh, pass plana vitrectomy actually really solves the whole problem. In fact, in many cases of intumescent cataracts and stuff, where you have this really shallow chamber and stuff, you really just go behind and uh, do a dry vitrectomy. And I know that it's, it's controversial saying that, but even doing a dry vitrectomy really adds a lot of value in those cases. You get that deep chamber, you protect the endothelium, you protect the bag from, from the phaco probe. The hydrated vitreous, which happens during phaco emulsification, especially if you have those weaker zonules, the hydration of the vitreous prevents itself if you do a dry vitrectomy. Uh, it's a procedure that I uh, talk about a lot. It's called vitrectomy-assisted phaco. Uh, so whenever you you know go behind and do a dry vitrectomy intermittently whenever you need. It's a different concept. Uh, may work, may not work in many hands. But uh, obviously, you need to know a lot of tricks before you actually do this. So don't just try it at home. <laughs> it's not something that is ideal. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, having said that, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajshekar, Dr. Siddhartha, uh, any yeah, comments? I have a point. I have Please. a point to make. Like uh, uh, a manitol one hour before the case also can do exactly what Ashwin does, uh, says. Like we don't even need to do a dry vitrectomy. We can just give manitol one hour before the case and that will reduce the third volume fluid and bring it down. But uh, till now, till I saw that video, I was thinking like an IOL in the sulcus is negative. I want to know the glaucometologist's point of view. If RKSR is here, we'll like to know from him. Because till I saw that video, I was thinking IOL in the bag is safer in a primary angle closure glaucoma variant uh, than to have an IOL in the sulcus. Uh, iridectomy, allowing the aqueous to freely come into the anterior chamber, I can understand. But keeping the eye oil in the sulcus and saying that will totally reconfigure the uh, dynamics there and push the anterior chamber deep, uh, it bit beats me. I think somebody else should enlarge that point. I'm also a little uh, missing about it. Yeah. Last yes, sir. Yeah. Now, Any I'm last comments before we close? Any, yeah. Anybody else? That's a, that's a valid point, though. Uh, Is the, the drama yes. here? No, wrong. RK can, RK can not spread. Yeah. He's not there. He's, He's not, not there. there. Okay. Okay. Then we'll close the session, Ashwin. Absolutely, sir. All yeah. yours. Yeah. I think, and uh, if, uh, thank you very much, Ashwin, for the wonderful, uh, I think, uh, video symposium, all the cases, international faculty. I would like to thank all the people and uh, request Nishant, the, the co moderator who has been coordinating the entire thing from the team, I said, along with Agarwal Hospital. Nishant is there around. Nishant, the flight attender is telling him to shut the phone. <laughs>
Nishant. I Nishant is boarded. I think Ashwin can do it. He's boarded the flight. Uh, it's it'll be difficult for him. Let's uh, let's leave Ashwin. him out of it. Poor thing. Ashwin can do it. Do no, Ashwin, I, I'll just yeah. I'll just give the close. I really Nivian, wanted to Nivian thank you. Nivian can do it. Uh, yeah, uh, Nivian can do it. Nivian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So oh, once yes. again, I think uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Ashwin and the whole Agarwal team for organizing this along with TNOA, Dr. Mohan Rajan sir, Raj Shekhar sir, so the entire people here. And a special thanks to our international faculty. It is always great to have them and amazed by all their videos. And we always learn from both of them. Thank you for being along and sharing your uh, points with us. And waiting to see you all soon in the physical meet. So that would be great. So it was a very, very interesting, very, very interactive and... I would definitely say the most challenging cases, each one of them presented a different challenging case, but the ease in which they managed, I think it would be very useful for all the viewers for lots of take-home points. Like in four minutes, they have like almost 10 to 15 uh, take-home points and everything. So when they watch the videos again, I think it's a very, very good learning thing. And I think that's the whole concept of this entire program to teach and also learn. So I think once again, thanks to the entire team for making it interactive and being there. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Rockstar, have, yeah. have a great Thank day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Arul and Bye. Sidhar, everybody, all the panelists. Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Siddharth and Sir. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Thank you.